Hey, what's up, bookworms, void bringers, chasm fiends, no matter what you identify as, it is time, guys. It's finally here. We're going to talk some rhythm of war. I'm not going to tell this whole story again. Here's the thing. Watch this video right here if you want to know what my plan is for coverage for rhythm of war. If you don't know, the books are separated into five acts, or he calls them parts with four sets of interludes. So what each one of these is going to be, since there are five parts and four sets of interlude, each one is going to be a part plus the interludes that come after that chapter. So obviously there'll be none after uh, part five, which will have no interludes. We'll just have an epilogue. So what I'm going to do here for part one is it's going to be the prologue chapters one through 19 and the first set of interludes. Now my spoiler talk isn't a beat for beat recap. This isn't a summary. This isn't a, hey, I need to get caught up. I'm just going to watch this instead of reading it. It's just where I talk about some of the biggest moments that I've read so far by each character and kind of things that I really like. You can check out all of the Stormlight Archive material on the channel if you want. I do want to add that I have read Don Shard. I decided to do that. But I know not everyone is doing that before they read Rhythm War, so I will not be talking about Don Shard here. So do not worry. You're safe. I'm going to try to resist talking about other books outside of Stormlight Archive that might tie in, like Warbreaker. It's going to have some stuff in here where I mentioned there's something that happens in Warbreaker, but I'm not going to spoil anything for you. Okay, since it's the first video, I wanted to get that out of the way first. But uh, going forward, we will just jump right into it. So guys, here we go. If you want to talk about Don Shard, by the way, jump on the Discord. People are talking about it like crazy. So uh, you can have plenty of conversation there. I'll talk with you about it there if you want to jump on. Okay, let's begin with Navani. I uh, was not really surprised to see that Navani is a big POV character in this, uh, nor was I really surprised to see that the prologue was taking place of her. I had mentioned in some of my previous reviews that I love that every prologue to this book is going to be uh, from a different point of view from the day that Gavilar was assassinated. So it's a nice little interesting uh, wrinkle with her. And it's nice to see kind of that, you know, I don't know, nice is the word I'm looking for, but she's basically running the kingdom. You know, uh, Gavilar's, uh, he's more worried thinking about his legacy. And she's basically running things. He's over here having, like, meetings with, uh, with I, I presume that they're heralds. I think that they're heralds. I don't know which one. I think one might be Null. Uh, I'm not really sure. But um, I'm sure that there's other people who could confirm or deny that. Uh, the herald stuff, like I said, guys, <whistles> a couple times. So uh, I would be, it would just be purely guessing. So I don't want to give anything definitive there. But anyway, uh, they're talking about stuff like world hopping. So like, okay, well, right off the bat. This seems like it's opening up the Cosmere a little more than uh, the previous Stormlight books. But uh, he very clearly despises her. Uh, not only does he think... I don't necessarily know that he thinks that she had an affair with Dalinar, but uh, people around the kingdom think that she does, and that's apparently that's good enough for him, you know, obviously because of her reputation. Uh, he thinks that uh, he only married her to, you know, to be queen. You know, simple stuff like that. Just seeing how awful their marriage truly is as someone who loves Nabani, it was really just... It's kind of soul crushing to see how the relationship really is. But, uh, you know, he finds her work with Sprin and Fabrials. He just kind of finds it foolish. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's just real heartbreaking. And, you know, and she certainly, she, <laughs> she I don't want to say kind of, it seems like she does. It seems like she, she goes and she prays for his death. And he basically does. So uh, it hasn't come across yet. But, I mean, that's obviously some kind of guilt that you're not going to just walk past. I don't think that's the last that we've really heard of this. And, and also, it kind of makes me think back to something that happened in Oathbringer when uh, when the Stormfather was marrying Dalinar and Navani. He did tell Navani that she had broken oaths before. So I don't know if it's anything to do with that or not. I don't know. That's just something that kind of popped in my mind. I might actually be remembering that wrong. Uh, but uh, it's something to, to kind of keep an eye on. I don't think that's going to you know, not come back. But after that, we're going back to present day here. This is about a year after Oathbringer. So uh, that right there, right away, was surprising. I don't think there's been that big of a time jump between books. Again, if it is, you have to forgive me. I read most of these uh, more than three years ago. But um, yeah, her present day Fabrial work does not seem to be silly or foolish because uh, the fourth freaking bridge, she's basically designed an airship here. I don't really want to call it like an airship. It's more like an air barge. But, you know, still, it's amazing advance in technology, right? And it's just one of those things that you never really kind of expect. It's kind of, we've kind of leaped into like Final Fantasy territory of fantasy here. So this is a really, really awesome thing. I love that she named it uh, Fourth Bridge. It's really cool. But uh, on Fourth Bridge, she does find this, this spannery that she doesn't know. It's from an unknown user. And this user is basically accusing her of being a monster, saying that she's imprisoned uh, and, and killed all these sprint and she's just, uh, she needs to stop. She needs to stop right away 
or else there's going to be consequences, right? So I have, I've been trying to rack my brain thinking who could be sending this to her. I mean, uh, I would want to just assume maybe it's one of the singers, one of the fuse, something like that. But I have no idea. It would really just be a guess. So I look forward to hearing some of you guys' theories down in the comments because I'm sure you might have a theory, but I have no idea who could be sending this to her. A uh, big moment that I liked is when she does confront Zeth. Now, Zeth is uh, her prisoner and um, really questioning him about the day that Gavilar died and uh, talk about that sphere that Gavilar gave her right before he died. And I, I'm not going to lie, I forgot. I completely forgot about that. That's all the way back in the Way of Kings prologue. I read that years ago, so I didn't even remember this. I had to actually do like a refresh. Like, what is she talking about right now? And, and ask some people on the Discord, and they helped me out. And I, I, I for, totally forgot about it. So uh, I still don't exactly know what it is, but apparently it can hold Stormlight or Voidlight for like years. Uh, that's that's very interesting. So I don't really know where we're going with this, but uh, it gives a nice little peek into what's going on with Zeth. I don't know what his end game is. I don't know if he's a. Uh, he seems to be a real stubborn kind of a. Uh, where if you ask him directly, ask him the question, he's going to tell you, but he's not just going to answer everything on his own. So uh, I don't really know what what's going on with that. Uh, I do know that. Um, I don't. I don't want to say anything that happens past part one. I haven't started reading it yet, but when I did get the book, I did. Go ahead and look at uh, some of the POV. Because you can go to part one, part two, part three. And he lists the POV characters for that section. And, and I did notice that Zeth has some uh, POVs in the interludes. Uh, not the uh, not the POVs in the chapter. So I'll be interested to see where they are going with him. But knowing that he will still be in the story, even if it's just on the fourth bridge. Uh, I, I'm really interested with that. Because I thought he had a ton of development. Uh, started Really started off his, uh, his, his, his redemption arc. And Oathbringer, I don't imagine he's going to stay a prisoner the whole book unless uh, unless Sanderson just doesn't have anything for him in this book and he's setting him up for book five. But we'll, we shall see. Later on, they're having like a war council uh, with this character, the Mink, that I'll get into when I talk about when I talk about Khaled in a minute. But uh, it's hinted at at this meeting that Yasna and Wit might be like romantically involved and that would just be weird. I just think they obviously know a lot more uh, about the realms and stuff than other people do. So I think that they just, you know, talk a lot in secret. So people assume that they are they are getting comfy with each other. But uh, Yasna, Dalinar, and Navani really do not seem to be on the same page as far as legislation goes. And I talked about this in my wish list. I really felt like... I don't think Yasna is going to be okay just being like a queen in name only. You know, she's not just going to wear the crown while Dalinar and Navani rule the kingdom. Uh, she's going to want to be involved. And I don't think it's like explosive yet. But I think it's going to get not necessarily nasty, but it's going to get heated between the three of them kind of pulling in different directions before the end of this book. That's my guess just based off of their conversation here because uh, she's got ideas and they've got ideas and they aren't exactly the same. They aren't one and one. So uh, it should be interesting how we go there. Now, before I start talking about Vinley here, guys, uh, if you this is the first Stormlight thing that you've watched on the channel, I want you to understand this is just my opinion, okay? If we have differing opinions on these things, that's excellent. I'm glad. That's what reading a book is all about. It's all about opinions, right? I am not crazy about the fuse, the singers, the partiality, any of that stuff. Not really that crazy about Vinley or Eshenai. A little bit more Leshley. We'll get into that here in a second. But here's the thing. Uh, Sanderson always proves me wrong on these things. So I said in my wish list, what I want him to prove me on is, uh, prove me wrong on is that he can make this character interesting for me. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, just in the first part. She only had two chapters in this first part. Uh, I'm more interested in some of the other characters. Yeah, it's pretty cool to get to know how their, their inner culture is and how their, you know, their, their politics work and like their circle and things like that. That's, that's really neat and all, but lots of info dumpy stuff here. I think probably my least favorite chapter of this uh, first part was, I think it's chapter 12 was hers. It's, it's the, probably the longest chapter, at least it felt like it was the longest chapter. Uh, I, look, she wants to create like a new society, you know, uh, uh, away from the fuse and the singers. And, and I get that. that, that that's interesting enough. Uh, it's just if she's supposed to be the focal point of this book, as I believe that she's supposed to be, uh, the setup hasn't exactly gripped me to this point. Uh, I think I found uh, Leshwi. Uh, a character I'm going to talk about more when I get to Kaladin's part again. Uh, but Lesian, I think it's Lesian. I, I think I'm finding those characters both more interesting. Lesian kind of makes me think of uh, uh, Cylon from the, the new Battlestar Galactica. It's new, it's like 15 years old at this point. But the uh, the, the more recent Battlestar Galactica adaptation, where uh, you know, the Cylons, obviously, once they die, 
they get reincarnated to another body, body and they have all those memories. Uh, where this one, Lesion basically talks about if uh, it ever falls in battle, then the new, new body, it doesn't do anything else until it defeats that person to beat them. So it's like basically, hey, you bested me, but I'm going to keep coming back until I beat you on my fifth or sixth try. A uh, very interesting idea in the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 it's got plans. So I find both those characters more interesting so far. And I think that uh, it does seem like a Lesian and Leshwi uh, throwdown is inevitable at some point. So uh, that's the one really to keep an eye on there. Vinley's just going to kind of be that... Uh, I said this in my first Law stuff, how he sets up characters sometimes where they may be the POV character, but they're really just there to be like the viewer of the more important characters. I don't know if that's the way it's going to be. Like I said, we're going to start getting flashbacks of Eshenai and, and Vinley in this book, uh, which we haven't yet. Uh, then, then obviously that's not going to be the case. But so far, that's what it seems like the more important characters there have been everyone in the chapter aside from Vinley. So I'm still waiting to be impressed on that. Again, I do not doubt Lord Ruler Sanderson that he'll get me there, but he didn't get me there yet. Someone I think a lot of people that view this channel feel the same way I do about Vinley, feel the same way about Shallan. Uh, I love Shallan. I know a lot of people have said that they felt like she's gotten more annoying uh, ever since the first book. Uh, I understand that she's a very divisive character, and I can understand that because there's three of her. You know, there's three different versions of her. And um, in this one, she's going on like a covert mission trying to get kidnapped uh, to confront uh, Eli. I hope I'm saying Eli right. Uh, I said in my wish list that I thought Eli was going to be a major player in this book. <laughs> Didn't quite turn out that way, but you know, she is uh, captured. Their plan goes off and she meets the Sons of Honor and eventually gets a meeting with Eli. And you see Eli is not quite this conniving mastermind that I was expecting. She's like totally freaked out. She thinks the ghost bloods are going to kill her, right? And she turns out to be room, uh, right, because she doesn't leave that room. Uh, she's dead before the end of this chapter. And this is my first, like, holy shit moment in this book. Uh, I, like I said, I thought she was going to end up being a major, major player in books four and five. And she doesn't make it through the first part here. So, um, you know, as much as uh, I was happy to see Sadius go, this one I was like, oh, man, it's another one of those instances where I feel like every time he has the opportunity for a really good villain, he kills them off. But you know what? He's a great storyteller, so I'm sure he has a reason for this. So I'm not really doubting that. It just, it just kind of really shot a lot of my uh, my uh, theories or speculation <laughs> right away. So all the way, all the way, this book is not uh, not going the way that I intended. But uh, one thing that comes out there is interesting is that the sons do reveal that they have a spy that is in Dalinar's inner circle. I started trying to think of who that could be, and I am not sure. Uh, don't think it's any of our major, major players. It's going to be some some character that we probably heard a couple of times in passing in book, Way of Kings, you know, like seven, eight years ago. I, I don't know. That's probably like my guess, but I'm not really sure if uh, they're telling the truth. I'm sure that they are. I don't see why you'd make something like that up to someone that you don't know. So while she was there, I think Vale was the one that was like planning on, you know, assassinating Eli. And the fact that she's actually poisoned and murdered before that happens, and she's like, yeah, it wasn't me. Uh, I really, really just kind of just set things in motion I wasn't expecting. And uh, they basically search the room and she finds like this hidden notebook, which has all kinds of ghost bloods information in it, including major, major connections to other Cosmo works. We hear about Skadriel, which is from Mistborn. Uh, we hear about, uh, God, what's it called? Nothis? Is that Nothis from, from Warbreaker? We hear about Taldane, which is from White Sand. And we're like, okay. This is crazy. I've always suspected that this was going to go into Dark Tower. Uh, uh, you don't know, Dark Tower by Stephen King was the story that he used to connect all of his stories into one. It's like the connective tissue that held that multiverse that he created together. And I've been saying I felt that Stormlight Archive was going to be that for the entire Cosmere. It was going to be the big one that kind of connected to everything else. And... Not that that was a wild theory or something. That's just what I've just expected ever since I read like the second book. And it very much seems to be the case with uh, Yuri Thiru kind of playing the role of the Dark Tower. But I, anyhow, uh, that's uh, for one of you tower junkies wanting to jump in on that. It's it's really, really cool stuff. But uh, I do want to say that I, I think that uh, Adolin is dealing with uh, being married to three different women very well. Uh, and not, not the way uh, some of you hornballs might think. I don't mean it like that. I mean, he is able to separate these different personalities like uh, they're his drinking buddies and then there's his wife. And I think that that's really special. You guys know I'm a big Adolin fan. He hasn't had a ton to do yet in this book. Uh, he does kind of uh, do something with Kaladin a little later, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, 
I, again, this guy is just way too good uh, of a dude, the way that he is able to just handle this flawlessly. It's, it's really great. It's really, really great. I, I appreciate the relationship. And uh, I def that's why I keep saying that Shalon chose right, because uh, I don't see Caliban being able to process these things as well as Adolin has. But uh, yeah, anytime that they're actually together, it's cute. But seeing him actually interact with uh, with Vale and Radiant is, is pretty neat too. However, she still does not tell him about her uh, dealings with the ghost bloods, which I think is something that's going to uh, maybe put a damper on the relationship if he if she does not come clean about this soon. Nor does she tell him or anybody about this possible fourth identity that she feels kind of creeping around the back of her mind. I said in my wish list I didn't want another personality. Well, it seems like it's going to be coming anyway because I feel like it's going to really start to get convoluted if we have like five, six, seven personalities for this one character. But uh, I don't necessarily know that it's going to come forward or if she's just being paranoid. I just, I don't feel like Sanderson does anything like that without it meaning something. So we shall see. Uh, she does have a meeting with Mraze. One of my other things in my wish list is I wanted the ghost blood stuff to be kind of important. Well, it feels like it's kind of taken a step on, up on that. Not only does Mraze seem to know a lot about the Cosmere, lots about world hopping and things, uh, he does give her a new mission. You know, it turns out that Honor Sprint are not exactly wanting to bond with humans anymore. So we are running out of radiance. So he wants her to go to uh, Lasting Integrity in Shadesmar and locate someone named, is it Restarez? Is it Restairs? I don't know how to say this name, guys. I don't audiobook, uh, but Restarez is what I'm saying. Uh, it's supposed to be at the Capitol. And uh, then we're going to see where we kind of go from there. And that's kind of what Shalon's up to in this one. Uh, he promises he's going to give her all the answers she wants after she does this mission. So uh, we shall see. Let's move on to Kaladin Spearman. Look, I really thought it was cool starting all the POVs in this book with Liren. That is Kaladin's father. I did not expect that. Very neat little wrinkle. I love that he's not so beholden that these are my five POV characters in this book and no one else can have a POV. He's kind of doing the Joe Abercrombie thing where he has that, but he'll also throw like a random POV in now and then. And I dig that. I like that a lot. It makes the world feel more real. It also makes it feel like you're not just a, a slave to the narrative. I, I like that he's able to actually move around. You know, he'd been doing that just with his interludes, but it seems like now he's starting to throw in some regular chapters during the main structure too. And, and, and I dig that. And seeing this uh, from, uh, from Liren's point of view and seeing how he still does not approve of the life decisions that Kaladin has made, just kind of sucks as, as, you know, as someone who's, who's dealt with family members who don't approve of anything that you do, you know, it, uh, it, it I said, that's what I always like about these books is I'm able to, uh, that, that always resonates with me. So Lyran is providing like sanctuary to these band of Herdazian rebels led by this character named the Mink. And I want to say that I'd heard of this before this book, but I might just be thinking, I, I swear he was mentioned in an interlude or something somewhere. Cause how do you forget a dude named the Mink, right? Uh, but uh, then the uh, the fuse show up looking for him. That's when Kaladin and his posse show up, and you know it, it, it's on. But uh, it seems like Kaladin has gotten a new rival, and this is uh, Leshwi, this uh, this fused, and it's a different. I've said this whole time. I never really cared about the fused or the Parshini or anything like that. I'm really interested in this one because uh, Leshwi seems very different. Seems to have like some kind of code of honor, almost like a Klingon or something. Uh, you know, there's one point where Leshwi has sigil, like Desiderites, could kill them, doesn't, out of respect. And it's just like, wow, okay, so this is something different. Yeah, and I think that Sanderson's always good about establishing his characters as not being one-note, mustache-twirling villains just for the sake of being bad. Uh, I mean, I think in many ways we proved in the last book with the Dawn Chant that they aren't necessarily the bad guys, right? So uh, it's a nice new wrinkle in giving uh, one of these characters some layers uh, because, like I said, I'm finding all of them more interesting than Vinley at this point. And something that I, I've complained about when I talked about Oathbringer, I said one of the problems I have with this series is I felt like he overpowered his characters too quickly. You know, they can fly, uh, they can take a stab wound right to the heart. Oh, Stormlight, I'm all good now. Uh, I said he needed to find a way to depower them. Enter Voidlight Fabrials. Apparently this can uh, either suppress or drain Stormlight. Uh, there's one point where I said it feels like it, it, it's just completely separated Kaladin away from Sylphrina so far that like he couldn't even use her. So he has to actually like bust out some of his old, you know, military skills. And that was really cool again, but this is great. 
This is what I wanted. I didn't want to cheat code depowering or anything, but this is really, really neat idea uh, to, to make it more of a level playing field because I felt like there was going to be no stakes if we just had our, our Radiants basically be invincible as long as they had Stormlight. So uh, it's a nice little wrinkle. So I'm glad that, uh, that he's kind of found something to kind of work in there, even if I don't understand exactly how this Fabio works yet. But then there's the big moment where he has a confrontation with Moash. Now look, first of all, I said that Sanderson is like king of like the redemption arc, right? And he was making Roshon. Roshon, if you don't know, that's the one who sent uh, Kaladin's little brother off to war, which was like a real dick, and, and Kaladin just like, gave him a big shiner in Oathbringer. It seemed like he was starting to turn a new leaf. He really was trying to do right by this town of a hearthstone. He was trying to really take care of these people. Uh, this building's burning. He wants to go save these people, whatever. And Moash just shows up and does what Moash does and cuts his throat. At least he didn't salute this time, bastard. But uh, no, he does something even worse. He, he surrenders, and then he starts talking to Kaladin, getting in his ear, basically telling him to go kill himself, trying to convince him to commit suicide. It's just... <laughs> it's why I get the people that they are a good friend of mine, who the one who actually uh, turned me on to the series, is like, hey, what did Moash really do wrong? It's the, the, what did Moash did nothing wrong, people? Just... <laughs> because <laughs> uh, every time this guy shows up now, I just want to punch a wall. But look, Kaladin's mental state in this one... Uh, it's probably the darkest it's been since he was about to jump off that ledge in Way of Kings. And it's for that very reason, I think, that uh, Dalinar feels it's his responsibility to relieve him of duty. Uh, he can tell, you know, that there's people who are broken by war and there is no coming back from it. So he basically fires the guy. It's sobering, but it's one of those things where you're like, look, this sucks because this is everything to Kaladin, but it needed to be done. It needed to be done. This is, was this basically going to be a, a a suicide bomber type of guy if he didn't, because he's just he's not all there right now. Uh, he needs a change in lifestyle. He needs to get off these front lines. So I understood it, but man, it was tough to read. It really was. And speaking of Dalinar, my dude's kind of a ghost in this book. You know, I, I talked about um, how I thought after Oathbringer being primarily you know very Dalinar heavy, that I thought he was going to take a step back as far as the narrative in this. He's not even a POV character, at least not through this per first part. And I expect that, but still. That's my favorite Stormlight character, and he's just kind of like in the background of some of Navani's chapters. And it's, I hope that changes because I do need my Dalinar, even if he doesn't have POV chapters in this one. Yes, I know I just got a whole book of them. Still, you know, you don't want your favorite character to like not even be in one of these big 1200 page books, right? So uh, that, that'd that be a complaint I have with the first part, but I do think Dalinar will show up when it matters, of course, because I mean, that's the dude, right? Uh, but on top of all of this depressing things going on, now Rock is actually leaving. He's going back to his homeland to face judgment for killing Amaram. You know, so uh, this is just like, man, for lack of a better term, Kaladin's hitting rock bottom, isn't he? This is really, really low. And when he's at his lowest, my guy Adolin comes through again, drags him off to go get a drink, and basically just forces him to not sit in his room and wallow in depression. That's my dude right there. He, watching out for him. I mean, the friendship that has grown between these two is incredible. You know, I think he even actually called him Kaladin once in this book and not Bridge Boy. So it's a, it's, it's a really cool uh, friendship, a bromance. I like reluctant bromance. You know, now that the whole Shalon thing has been resolved, I feel like they can actually be true friends now. And I'm here for it. I want that to happen. Uh, but uh, it's not like he did anything great, you know, but just making him go out, making him not stay by himself in his room was a really cool move, huh? Uh, let's see here. Try, he's trying to get uh, a sprint to bond with Relaine. And I thought that was kind of weird how he's like wanting to force. I mean, you can't really force a bond, can you? That doesn't seem right. But he keeps at it and to the point where the sprint finally agrees. And then Relaine's like, no, I, I don't want it. You know, you can't. He says the same thing. You can't really force this bond. So uh, respect for Relaine for doing that. You know, saying, you know, I, I, I'm going to have a bond. I want it to be real. I don't want it to be forced. It's like it's like trying to force two cops together to be partners that, that, that don't know each other. You know, you would rather have people you know are going to work good as a team. It's going to be a true bond, not a forced bond. So I'm glad that Relaine kind of took a stand there. Uh, but... Keep on developing my Bridge 4 guys, man. I'm for that. I love that. Uh, it's characters that you don't even think would get big moments, and they still do this far into the series. So uh, interesting to see what's going to happen for Lane going forward. But again, everything Kaladin's doing right now, if you look at it from his point of view, it just seems like he's failing. He's just fucking up at everything, right? So, you know, he's going in that downward spiral again. It sucks. But uh, he visits Zahel for, for, uh, for guidance. 
uh, basically wonders if he should join the Ardentia. That should be his next move. So as a hell decides, hey, let's test out your blade. Let's have a fight. And I don't want to get too much into it, guys, because this is Warbreaker spoilers. So I'm not going to actually get into details here. Just know, if guys, if you are a person who has read Warbreaker, and you should be because it's a fantastic book, and it is almost required reading for Stormlight Archive, especially as we keep going further, uh, you know who Zahel actually is, and you know what Breaths, and you know what Awakening is. So this scene is absolutely awesome. I know most people are going to be like, wait, 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 Kaladin's fighting a guy with a rope and a blanket? What's going on? Guys, read Warbreaker in this scene is so wonderful, especially when he basically does a huge Cosmere info dump on him about things. Really cool stuff. Nice stuff with Nightblood in there too. But really, my favorite chapter of this first part, not just because how much I love uh, Warbreaker, but because I was afraid that uh, Zahel and Azur were just going to be cameos in the series. Azur still might be. She hasn't shown back up yet. But uh, I was afraid they're just going to be cameos, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like they're going to be important characters. And if this is the angle that they're going to take with Kaladin for the rest of this book with him training under Zahel, I am there for it. I know I've said in my Rage of Dragons review and uh, in the follow-up Fires of Vengeance where I said I'm kind of sick of training sequences in these books. But uh, with this stuff, I think this could be really, really good. And I wonder if we're going to start kind of taking some of these Cosmere powers like Allomancy, like Breaths and stuff like that. And we're going to start moving them into uh, the Stormlight under Roshar. That would be really, really cool. And in Kaladin's last chapter, you know, he's bringing his folks into Eurothero, showing them their new quarters and stuff like that. And he shows Lear in the, uh, the basically the medical ward that he's put together for him. And it's one of those things where, again, you feel like, oh, man, Kaladin, everything he does is just blowing up in his face because his father starts saying, you know, now that we have, uh, you know, Radiance, it can heal people with a touch and stuff. You know, surgeons are a thing of the past. I got to find something to do again. But then he talks to his dad like, you know what? There's only a few of them. We're still going to need doctors. And he just makes his dad so happy by basically saying, yes, I will return you know, to, uh, to practicing medicine with you. And it's a really good moment. And I think it's, uh, it's one of those that Kaladin definitely needed because he was definitely feeling pretty low after this. And now he has his father who he can work under and hopefully he can learn more under Zahel and he'll have something to do, uh, you know, outside of just the military stuff. But I mean, I think it's only a matter of time before he's fighting again. But I think for this book, we might be seeing him branch out a little bit. And I'm always up for adding some new layers to a character as layered as Kaladin. Let's talk about Terra Vangian. Now, that's a character I've been really intrigued by this whole series. And I don't know necessarily it's just been because it's been such small doses, but he's been being watched closely since he admitted to being the one who sent Zeth, right? Uh, understandably. And, and he's just, uh, they basically, you know, they have this alliance, but it's a very uneasy alliance. And uh, Navani has a confrontation with him. And look, I don't think anyone could scare Navani but Terra Vangian scares her. You know, she's very freaked out by him. And I think he really surprises everyone when he agrees to the battle plans that Dalinar and the Mink have kind of drawn up. And I mean, they all still suspect him. So they expected him to, uh, to, to say something different, but he kind of goes along with it. So they're all really surprised, but I think it just makes them suspect him even more. And that's why when we get into uh, the first set of interludes and we get uh, Terra Vangian's point of view, you haven't read the interview interviews let be, be careful uh he does it is revealed that he does intend to betray the Elethi uh based off of odium's design this was part of the deal that they had made he wanted carbroth protected uh so he starts uh he starts to dismiss some of his followers his friends his family because he doesn't want to bring them down with them because he knows obviously he once he betrays them you know there's no going back for him uh he's going to be uh captured he's going to be executed uh talks about uh you know how he's going to, you don't get any honors. Lefty, they do not give you any honors when you're a traitor at your funeral. They just burn you. You know, that's it. You'll be done. He's like, what do I care? I'm going to be dead. But the thing to me, as I said, I was always so intrigued by the diagram. He says that this proves that the diagram has fulfilled its purpose. It saved his people, you know, and he takes the, uh, the diagram that he had actually put in that leather bound book and he throws it in the fire. So uh, I don't want to believe that's actually the end of the diagram. I mean, you know, we have the uh, the whole society that's based around the, the diagram as well, but I, I don't know where we're going to go with this. I really just don't think it's going to be the end of Teravangian. It's just been too important of a background character. And now that we're getting 
things, maybe from his point of view, I just really can't see this being it. He betrays him and then he gets executed and that's it. But you know, as far as he's concerned, you know what? His his uh, his his line is secure, and his people are safe, and his city is going to be fine. So uh, you see where he's coming from for sure. Uh, but uh, I just think that there's more coming to it. There are a couple of miscellaneous things here. Um, I know I'm going to butcher this name. I have no idea how to say it. Jahanat, Jahanat, Jahanat. I have no idea how to say it. Uh, but she does release a corrupted sprin into your Thiru and tells it to find a make a bond with a human host be picky that kind of thing don't really know first I thought that was uh, going on to uh, t- going on to Renarin's uh, uh, sprint there but it seems to be a totally different one unless I kind of read that wrong I don't know I just, I just read it like you know 10 minutes ago before I started this uh, but uh, also Odium tells her yo let me worry about the tower you need to worry about Teravangian focus on Teravangian I'll worry about the tower and she says she's got no problems with that because for her, Teravangian is a weapon. So, like I said, I don't think we've seen the last of Teravangian in this. Uh, we also get a quick one from Sylphrena. I had no idea. Apparently, this chapter had already been released in like a newsletter or something like that. But she's basically wanting to know what it feels like for Kaladin when he goes dark. You know, when he's having one of his depressive fits. Um, she wants to know what that feels like. So she asks the Stormfather if he can make her feel this and he says no i'm not going to do that so she seeks out dalinar ask him if he can do it i think he just talks to her and makes her realize that uh that she already knows what this feels like because the first time uh she was bonded to someone when that night i think his name was relador when he died uh she kind of felt that it's just kind of one of those things of making her kind of uh you know understand how what kaladin's going through thing so it's a interesting little self monologue she has about uh, two different sides of the brain you know the dark half and the light half it's uh definitely something like i said as someone who suffered from depression i definitely understand uh where that's coming from and i appreciate that sanderson is taking no breaks from writing his characters as damaged and trying to understand them more i love that about this series it's things that i feel like uh, isn't pandering or checking off box or anything like that it really makes these characters more relatable. At least they do for me. And guys, uh, that's pretty much it for part one. I think it's very much a setup part, like as expected. Uh, I did expect this to be, uh, I felt like Oathbringer was was packed with action in that first half and with flashbacks and stuff. Whereas this definitely seems like it's setting the board up. Uh, I, I do know that Sanders said he planned on having like three story, three central stories within one here. And I think those are going to be what uh, Navani... Dalinar and Yasna are kind of going to be running the campaign. Then you're going to have the second one's going to be uh, Shallan, and I assume Adolin going to uh, Lasting Integrity. And I'm just judging that off of the book cover, really, that Adolin's going to go with her. And then Kaladin at the fork in the road and his inevitable uh, showdown with uh, Leshwi and uh, the other fused singers, all that whole stuff there. So uh, interesting setup. I'm having a great time so far. I can't wait to see where we're going. I've gotten already gotten some uh, some answers I wanted to know. I already got uh, some letdowns like Eli that I wasn't expecting. So uh, hey, the Lord Ruler keeps you guessing. But guys, here's where I want you to jump in the comments. Please keep it to just part one and those interludes because I know people are going to be watching this as they go along. At least they told me that. Uh, so uh, don't be talking about anything past uh, interlude number three in the comments below. And I will talk to you there, guys. Enjoy your read. <music>